All right. Thank you so much to the organizers for giving me this chance to share my research. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm a graduate student in Jesse Bloom's lab at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And so today I'll tell you about some of my recent work on influenza evolution. So a really fundamental aspect of influenza biology is the fact that flu viruses evolve extremely rapidly from year to year across the globe. You can see that here in the spindly shape of this phylogenetic tree, which reflects the fact that new flu variants are constantly emerging and then outcompeting existing strains. Each of the tips on this phylogenetic tree represents the infection of one human individual. And a person, while they're infected, may harbor billions or even trillions of flu viruses. And that can be a lot of genetic diversity. Until recently, almost everything that we've learned about flu evolution has come from consensus sequencing, which effectively averages across all of this genetic variation. And that can tell us a lot, but we are missing a lot of subtler evolutionary dynamics. More recently, high-throughput deep sequencing has made it a lot easier for us to zoom into a viral population and try to understand um, its really fine-grained evolutionary dynamics. And that's what I'll tell you about today. So I want to start by talking about a case of viral evolution in cell culture. And so this story starts about 10 years ago when various flu labs around the world started noticing that when they took clinical flu samples and passaged them in cell culture, a certain flu variant would arise again and again. So for this part of the talk, I'll refer, I'll refer to the wild type variant in blue and the mutant variant in red, and they differ by just a single nucleotide mutation, D151G, in the viral exit protein. Now initially, people thought that this mutation was probably just a lab adaptation, which is very common for flu. But there were a couple observations that suggested to us that this might not be the case. For one, the supposed lab adaptation never seemed to reach fixation. There were many reports of mixed viral populations, but it didn't seem to ever fix on its own. Second, another group did a biochemical study of the D151G mutation, and they found that it actually destroys the catalytic activity of the viral exit protein. We couldn't really think of a good reason why this loss of function mutation would constitute an adaptation, and so that's why we were kind of left puzzled by this. We wanted to understand the system a little bit better, and so we started off just by trying to assess the growth of these two viral variants in the lab. Here I'm just showing you a simple growth curve for the wild type and mutant variant. And you can see that the wild type variant grows quite robustly, whereas the mutant variant lags um, a lot behind the wild type. All of that is in line with what we would expect based on what we know functionally about these two variants, but it doesn't really explain why this mutant variant is arising. We decided to try growing these viruses in a mixture. Specifically, we assayed the growth of a 50-50 mixture of these two viral variants. And to our surprise, we found that this mixture of two viral variants actually outgrows either pure viral population. In other words, it seems like these two viruses are able to grow better together than they can apart. So we thought this might be an example of viral cooperation, and there's been a lot of interest in this topic recently, simply because RNA viruses mutate so rapidly that they always exist as sort of a genetically diverse quasi-species of related variants. So there's been a lot of um, discussion about the topic of whether these populations can, have, um, can cooperate with each other, but so far it's been really difficult to hone in on specific mechanisms of cooperation. But here we thought we'd found a specific molecular example. And to try to understand this a little bit better, we started just doing an evolution experiment in the lab. Here I'm showing you an experiment where we started off with a pure population of this mutant viral variant. And then over several cell culture passages, we see that the wild type variant arises spontaneously and then eventually increases to make up about half of this viral population. Now, if we start at this 50-50 equilibrium, we see that this mixture of variants is stably maintained throughout our entire experiment in cell culture. Now, conversely, if we start with this wild-type variant, we do see that over time this mutant variant also arises spontaneously and begins to reach a substantial frequency. Now, these results are extremely similar across three independent biological replicates. And all of this suggests to us that both of these variants are really contributing to the overall fitness of the viral population. 
So we've done um, a bit of work trying to identify the molecular mechanism of cooperation. I'm going to skip over all of that here for the sake of time. Um, but the point I really want to emphasize is just that almost without looking, we've identified this instance of viral cooperation that seems to have arisen spontaneously and repeatedly in hundreds of samples in labs all across the world. And so I think this is just one cool example of how deep sequencing can uncover some really interesting evolutionary dynamics. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on a slightly different system of viral evolution, and that's the viral evolution that happens within infected individuals while they're sick. So I think within host evolution is really fascinating, just because all of the rapid global evolution of influenza ultimately has to start with de novo variants that arise within single infected individuals. Now, some of those de novo variants may survive a severe bottleneck in order to transmit to um, other individuals. And an even smaller proportion of those variants may go on to spread or even fix on the global scale. So I think it's really fascinating to think about how evolution at these small um, and large scales compare to each other. How does within host evolution compare to and ultimately contribute to these global evolutionary patterns? Now, studying flus within host evolution is a little bit tricky just because most flu infections are extremely short, lasting something like five to seven days. I realize this does not feel very short when you're sick, but um, from a research standpoint, it's hard to do more than just take sort of a static cross-section of viral genetic diversity at a single point. We were really interested in measuring viral evolutionary dynamics across time. And so we started collaborating with clinicians at the Fred Hutch and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance to study a cohort of four immunocompromised patients who had extremely lengthy flu infections lasting multiple months. Now we had access to viral samples that have been collected approximately every one to two weeks during the course of these infections. And so by deep sequencing all of these viral samples, we could actually measure evolution over time um, within these patients. All right, so what did we find? Here's just a small um, snapshot of our results here. And so I'm showing you six of the non-synonymous mutations that we identified within a single patient in our study. And these are all of the non-synonymous mutations within one gene, hemagglutinin. So I'll focus on hemagglutinin for the rest of my talk. It's the main antigenic determinant of influenza. So you can see here right off the bat that there actually is a substantial amount of evolution within this one patient. We see a good number of non-synonymous mutations arising, reaching high frequencies, and sometimes even fixing during the course of this infection. We wanted to understand a little more about what was driving these evolutionary dynamics. And one clue came from comparing the evolutionary trajectories in different patients in our study. To our surprise, we saw that sometimes the exact same mutation would arise independently in multiple patients. And again, we know that these patients did not infect each other. So here I'm showing you the A138S mutation, which arises in two of the four patients in our study. And looking more broadly across the hemagglutinin gene, we see various sites where you see the same pattern of recurrent mutation in multiple patients. Now, all of this indicates that there's selection favoring the um, increase in frequency of these particular mutations. And if we plot the sites of mutation on the crystal structure of hemagglutinin, we can sort of get an idea for why. You can see that four of these recurrent sites of mutation cluster in the globular head domain of the protein. And this is the main target of immune selection. This makes us hypothesize that a lot of these mutations are involved in helping the virus escape from the patient immune responses. Now, even in the presence of strong selection, we see some kind of complicated evolutionary trajectories with a lot of fluctuations. So we thought that something that might contribute to that is the fact that each influenza gene evolves clonally without homologous recombination. We wondered whether clonal interference between beneficial mutations in this population might contribute to some of these fluctuating evolutionary dynamics. To try to understand this better, we focused in on four of those sites of mutation that I showed you earlier. And so again, these are all located in the same gene, just within one patient. And these mutations are actually close enough to one another that using short read sequencing, we can identify what combinations of mutations are present at what frequencies at each point in time. 
And that's what I'm showing you here. So each of the colors is a different haplotype carrying different combinations of mutations at just these four sites. The gray lineage is the wild type haplotype. And you can see that this lineage actually goes extinct over the course of the infection. We very quickly see the emergence of multiple single mutant lineages. Later on, we see this double mutant lineage arising, and later even a couple triple mutants. So overall, there's two points I really want to emphasize here. One is that even within one patient, we see multiple lineages carrying different combinations of mutations that are competing with one another. So this is a quite remarkable amount of evolution. Second, we can actually reconstruct the most likely evolutionary trajectory of this population. And that tells us that certain mutations, like A138S, must have arisen independently on different genetic backgrounds within this patient. In this case, it must have arisen once on the wild-type lineage to form a single mutant, and then once on the double mutant lineage to form a triple mutant. So again, this seems to suggest that there's strong selection for this particular set of mutations to arise, even at the level of a single patient. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is this question of how within host evolution actually compares to evolution across the globe. So we wondered whether any of these recurrent um, mutations within hosts might reach high global frequencies. And to our surprise, we saw that this was um, frequently true. So this S138A mutation, which we see in two patients, actually reaches a, fre a global frequency of about 25% um, as of a couple of years ago. And looking more broadly across the set of, um, of recurrent mutations, we see similar patterns where these recurrent mutations often reach high frequencies or even fix within the global flu population. I'm just showing you a small set of mutations here, but we did look more broadly across the flu genome. And we found that within the hemagglutinin gene specifically, sites of within host and global evolution showed more overlap than we would expect under various models of evolutionary constraint. But we didn't find that this pattern was true in the rest of the flu genome. And so again, I think this points to the role of hemagglutinin in um, antigenic selection. So just to sum up this part of the talk, um, I think what we found is that influenza virus can display really astoundingly similar evolutionary dynamics across vastly different scales of space and time. At the level of individual hosts, we see a small set of mutations arising multiple times on distinct genetic backgrounds. We see some of these same mutations arising um, within multiple independent patients in our study, and some of these mutations also go on to reach substantial global frequencies. Altogether, what I hope that I've shown you today is that I think it's really exciting that deep sequencing can help us zoom in into viral populations and identify really striking and sometimes surprising evolutionary dynamics, um, whether you're looking in cell culture or in natural human infections. And so I think it'll be really exciting um, moving forward um, to use deep sequencing to continue to expand our understanding of viral evolution. I want to thank um, my advisor, Jesse Bloom, as well as all of the clinical collaborators who made this work possible. And I also want to thank my funding from the NSF and the Hertz Foundation. And most of all, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>